I believe, most interesting studies that we're sort of working on um, at the moment. Um, and yeah, sort of where we're up to and in and, and, and places a little bit of preliminary results. Okay, so new wastage. Uh, this is a big one for farmers in terms of uh, reducing profitability. And most farmers, when you talk to them, say they have a 25% replacement rate, but there's actually very little data on it. So that's sort of why this, where this study came from. Um, the concept being that the, the, the greater the, the U wastage you have, it it's hugely impacts on your profit. Um, and in two ways, it means you, you need to keep more ewe lambs as replacements as opposed to selling them. And it also means that you're going to have a younger average age flock, which means you'll have um, overall lower fecundity and, and lower um, reproductive performance. So in this area, we've done a nationwide study looking at where um, wastage occurs and at timing of the year. And we've looked at those animals um, through their lifetime and tried to identify risk factors for wastage. Um, what we found is that little levels of wastage are very variable between five and 35%. Um, and that's both within farms and between years. Uh, most of the losses that we see on farm are, as you'd expect, between set stocking and weaning. Um, and the risk factors for you dropping out of the flock includes uh, low body condition score, uh, use which are having multiples year after year, um, and use that were mated as hoggets but then aren't um, fed sufficiently to reach those two dose target weights. We're also doing some work looking at um, moving away from a, a Romney um, crossbred uh, system to a <laughs> self shedding flock. But doing that without selling all your sheep and buying a new sheep. So basically um, buying in rams and, and doing that slowly over time. So in that, um, we're sort of, we've got two studies. The first one's looking at all the production data um, of, of that process. So we're currently in the, the third year of that process. So we started with a Romney flock and we mated them to Wiltshire rams. And each year we've um, mated the hoggets to Wiltshire rams. So we're steadily increasing the port proportion of Wiltshire genetics in the flock um, and monitoring the, the production characteristics over that time and also the, the, the wool. Um, and the second study is uh, on another farm, but it's looking at the, the genetic components um, of shedding sheep and trying to identify the genes involved in that process. All right, our third study is the, um, the biggest um, pastoral grazing study um, that's been funded in New Zealand, um, which includes a whole lot of collaborative partners, including um, uh, both Lincoln and Egg Research. Uh, but the aim here is basically to provide some science around uh, regenerative farming practices, specifically the grazing management, and to compare that with what we talk about as conventional best practice management. So in this study, we're, we're trying to measure everything in terms of um, the, the pasture production, quality, um, seasonal pattern, the effects on the below ground things, which is a, which is um, the common um, suggestions of what might be different under regenerative farming practices in terms of soil carbon, um, the the good bugs and the the insects in the soil, um, the the effect on the the bulk density and the permeability of that soil, um, and the nitrate leaching and emissions from that. And then of course, we're also looking at the, uh, the production uh, on the, on the, uh, from the livestock. So for this, we've got, um, yeah, we've got two, two studies within it. We've got a sheep study. Um, so the sheep um, study is set up as uh, farmlets, which is a two by two scenario. So it enables us to look at both 
what we talk about is standard pasture, so a ryegrass uh, with a bit of legume in it, and a diverse pasture where we have a lot of species included in the mix. And then on top of that, we're adding in the, the grazing management of conventional best practice management, um, which is based on a, you know, a history of um, you know, what's been done in New Zealand to date and compared to regenerative grazing management, which the general principles of that, or the general differences, is that we're wanting to allow a longer rest period between grazings and leave a higher residual. Right, we've also done um, some water studies looking at um, sheep's requirements for drinking water. This work came about as a result of um, us being unsure about where the regional requirements would go in terms of requiring um, fencing off waterways and potentially in, in more hilly country where you don't have troughs and paddocks you know, what is that going to actually mean for, for water access and, and being able to have, um, have those animals? So we started by looking at sheep at different times of the year um, and looking at their, their requirements for water. So how often did they go to the water source in the paddock, i.e. the trough, and drink? Um, and basically the first results from um, autumn, winter, and spring shows that in the New Zealand environment where with their pasture being having a high water content, they didn't go and drink. Um, so they, they didn't actually require any additional water than what was um, given to them in the pasture. We then looked at that over summer, because obviously that's a little bit different. Um, and we found that sheep infrequently went to the water trough, that in fact, they actually tended more to play around the water as opposed to drink. Um, and depending on how, how warm that was. So in Manawatu, they went twice a month on average, um, while in the Wairapa, which is a, a, a hotter environment, they, they went six times per month. <laughs> so this research is sort of carrying on in the, the concept of um, more the welfare scene in terms of the, the addition of shade and shelter that's, that's um, available through, um, through paddocks and the effect on new body, body temperature. Right, um, we've also done some work looking at nitrate leaching under sheep and beef cattle grazing, um, comparing different forage types that they're grazing. So from our perspective, one of the potentially lowest cost options for reducing nitrate leaching is just to change the type of pasture that you're growing. Um, so we've looked at that and the, the the preliminary results so far have shown that the nitrate leaching levels um, under sheep grazing are extremely low, um, which is really positive, and only about a quarter um, of what you'd see under dairy cattle grazing on a similar sort of soil type. Okay, so that was just a few of the studies that we've sort of um, um, in the midst of it at the moment, but we've also got heaps of things going on um, and more than keen to talk about them. Um, and uh, Nicola has been given some of the, uh, some documents that detail what else is going on if you're interested and want to have a look. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Lydia. Um, that was a really interesting presentation and, and a wide range of quite topical subjects being studied at the moment. Um, so I'm going to look forward to learning a bit more about the results of this work as, as it becomes published. Um, is there any way that farmers can find out a bit more about the work that you're doing or the results um, of that online? <clears throat> um. Not currently. The, the, the best option is to just contact the person um, in that the PDF document where it sort of outlines the studies. There'll be a, a contact for each of the studies is to get in contact with that person directly. Cool. OK, great. Um, and a reminder for any of you that might have any questions for Lydia, just make sure you pop them in the chat box and we'll um, put them to her at the end of the session. 
Radio, um, we'll move on now. So our next speaker is Professor Derek Moot, and he probably doesn't need an introduction because um, you're well known in this space. Um, amongst numerous other roles, Derek leads the Dryland Pastures Research Programme, investigating how legume-based pastures can enhance water and nitrogen use and combat climate change and change in variability in dryland regions. So Derek's going to talk about um, some of the highlights of the work that he's currently doing in this space. Thanks, Derek. Cool. Um, how are we looking? That come up? Yep, that looks great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Hill Country Futures Program, which has come to an end, and um, some of the on-farm measurements that we took within that look at some of the case study outputs, um, the Ag Yields database, and then our component of the Regen Ag work, which is which is called RAID. So um, your levies have funded a Hill Country Futures program that finished in um, December, but there's quite a bit of um, information coming out of that, and I led the forages component of that, so I thought this is an opportunity to give you some information about that. The basic premise was that there are still a lot of money to be generated from behind the farm gate, but we need to ensure that if we're generating income, we're doing it with um, technically correct operations and we're cognizant or aware of the social and environmental impact. So the first thing is to work out what is limiting production and then how do we pick the lowest hanging fruit to do that um, and also recognise that there are multiple ways in which farmers learn and in which information needs to be disseminated, including webinar, webinars like tonight. So we took the view that there are three strong systems that we have, particularly for our dryland farmers, um, rain-fed farmers, the lucerne, sub and red clover systems. So looking at right plant, right place. Um, in particular, people will tell you a lot of different things, but essentially um, water, nitrogen and temperature make plants grow. And... We can't get away from those factors. They are basic physics, um, basic truths as much as gravity exists. So water, temperature, nitrogen. And that the biggest requirement is to meet animal demand during lactation. So we need to be able to recognize these things as we're farming and also do things that are socially acceptable. And obviously from that perspective, we then pushed a legume dominant um, emphasis. And looking at trying to have um, science to challenge management. So what Lydia, myself and David are engaged in is really trying to do the science that we can challenge conventional practice. Um, we have to come up with information that enables you to make choices and change in your farm systems. So um, that's pretty much what we're trying to do when we're trying to develop either a grazing management package or an establishment package or whatever it may be. So we put this together and said, this is how we, we see information coming together. We can't do all of that within a program. So what we did was um, summarize a lot of the soils data. And the question was asked about where to get information. So I've put some of that in these. If people want information about the soils results um, from the last 30 years or so around hill country, uh, we've generated a whole lot of fact sheets, I think about a dozen that we've published um, throughout the program, looking at um, soil fertility and, and um, pea responsiveness and things like that. We also anticipated the rise of multi-species um, pastures. And so six years ago, we put in a 278 plot experiment, and um, that was part of the Hill Country Futures. We're still examining those results, but the outcome was pretty straightforward. Um, you can put as many species in as you want, but you need two to three as a maximum to maximize yield and quality. So those being a grass, a legume, and um, a herb, uh, if you're using nitrogen, but actually just a grass and a legume if you're not. Um, we then did some work on farm. A lot of work's been done previously looking at pasture production, and, and we do trials. But what, what we wanted to do was go and look at unimproved pasture and then see how it worked with improved pastures to put some data around it. So. This is some work from um, North Canterbury near Amberley, where we looked at um, chicory, red clover, white clover mixtures and how they compared with the, um, the resident pasture. And you can see that in each of the three years that we studied, we got um, at least a five ton yield advantage to those pastures. And that's essentially because you're getting the nitrogen in the system from your legume, which gives you greater water use efficiency. Most of our pastures are nitrogen deficient, and that's why Lydia will tell you that we don't leach that much. 
because most of our farm systems in sheep and beef sector um, have too much carbon in the soil and they it ties up the nitrogen. So getting nitrogen in is really important. And so this is the results from that one. Um, we also did the same on Banks Peninsula in a dry environment with lucerne and the unimproved pastures. And you can see again, um, the lucerne versus the unimproved, the lucerne producing um, between five and 10 tons of dry matter extra per year. Now, I've been harping on about lucerne for a long time, and I'm still a bit concerned about why people aren't using more of it. So we did some other things, which was go and talk to the young fellas that are doing it. And Tyler here, the property we were working on, um, put a video together for you uh, talking about hoggett mating. So what they do here is he has three and a half thousand hoggets and they essentially lamb on the lucerne. We don't aim for a two tooth weight here. We aim for a mixed age weight at the end of that grazing period. Because they're on high quality feed, they're lactating well, they're growing well, they come out about the same weight as a mixed age ewe. So um, we, we put a, a, a series of videos together around how Tyler does that. That farm went from 35 to 350 hectares of lucerne once we sort of indicated how to do the grazing management. Um, we also wrote up some of the work that we'd done previously. So the Bob Roy data that hopefully people in Central are aware of. Um, this was published in Grasslands in 2019, showing the increased changes in, in um, lamb productivity here from 90 tonnes to 150 tonnes. And looking at why that happened, um, essentially an increase in the mean daily growth rate of the lambs, but more importantly, um, a decrease in the time to weaning. So if you've got good quality feed, you can wean earlier and um, the ewe can, can then go off the um, good quality feed and you leave more of it for the lambs and the income data we published as well. So the Hill Country Futures was very really about getting the evidence together and disseminating it to farmers. Um, we did the science base. We then created some other um, resources, some extension resources, and um, tried to indicate the financial resilience. One of those um, resources was um, the creation of a, an ag yields database. So we did some videos on how to actually collect pasture production on your own farm. And one of the things I thought was lacking is actually a repository of where all that growth rate goes. So David and Lydia and I have been collecting data for 20 years. Uh, well, not Lydia, but certainly David and I. Um, and some of it just ends up in publications and then goes nowhere. So we've created this national database where all growth rate data from throughout uh, New Zealand is now collated. And we can get things like the pasture growth rate from different species. Um, and really the limitation of this database is, is um, only how much data people put in. So we can take peer reviewed published data, but also if you've collected data on farm, then we're certainly keen to get that put into um, the database as well. All data that's been collected is valuable. The other thing we did was look at, I've predominantly worked on summer dry, but this is a, a, a summer moist um, Inverary Station, John Chapman's property. And we said, well, can we take the same principles from a legume based system into, in this case, the high country um, up the Ashburton Gorge? And, and John presented this at Grasslands last year, but effectively he did some of his cage cuts. And then we came and um, looked at some of that data. The key take home message for him was that he could put superphosphate onto his unimproved hill country but really all it was doing was giving him a bump at a period when he already had feed. So he was getting more feed in November and December when he actually already had plenty of feed in November and December. What he really needed was spring feed. So we developed this satellite concept where you take a, a small patch of land and intensify it. Um, and so he measured the intensification of that and looked very much at what sort of early spring growth rates he was getting. So as lucerne, red clover, legume rich pastures, doing um, 80 to 100 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day because they're not nitrogen deficient. Most of our hill country is, is nitrogen deficient. So we either pour nitrogen on it or we develop these high quality pastures. And um, over his whole farm, again, similar sort of data, um, five to eight ton increases from the improved versus the unimproved pastures. And this is John's data, he basically says, um, you know, in the, in the final year, after four years of red clover, he drilled an annual ryegrass and produced 31 tonnes of dry matter in that year. Now, this is summer safe. If you go to most summer safe countries, they'll tell you they produce 10 to 12 tonnes of dry matter, but that's because they're nitrogen deficient. The potential is to do 15 to 20 um, if you can get nitrogen in the system. 
uh, he was very keen to explain that his scanning of his mixed age views has gone up and um, the land wastage has gone down. So if we think of land wastage being 20, 22%, then he's dropping from 25 to around 15%. So there's some lessons there from John, which are in the paper that I'm not going to go through here. Um, our component of the regenerative agriculture program that Lydia introduced is a dryland farmlet at Lincoln. And so we have an eight hectare farmlet and um, it's quite comprehensive, um, but we have four treatments and those are laid out in a Latin square. So we have high fertility uh, regenerative agriculture mixes and then we have low fertility re regenerative agriculture mixes. So that's Olsen P of um, less than 10 versus Olsen P of 20. And we do the same with um, conventional agriculture. So we have coxfoot and subclover as the pasture and then lucerne. So that's what we're doing for our um, conventional pastures. And then we have that in a high and low fertility situation as well. So just some photos here of um, animals grazing those pastures that started last year. And we'll start producing some results from that um, that people will be able to get hold of in, in the next 12 months or so. So um, we've got animals in these farmlets and they stay on, the animals grazing ground stay on the treatment that they've been allocated to. So in conclusion, um, legumes are required to overcome water and nitrogen deficiency. Lucerne grazing works, particularly during lactation. We've been developing red clover satellites. We've got an Ag Yields National Database for people and in the regenerative agriculture dryland experiment, watch this space, we've got information to come. So that's my uh, 15 minutes worth Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks, Derek, for blasting through all of that. Um, some really interesting work being done there, and it's really great to see it being made available in a user-friendly format so that um, industry and farmers can access it easily. That's really awesome. Um, so as a reminder, if you haven't checked it out, um, there's a Hill Country Futures website, which is www.hillcountryfutures.co.nz. Um, which includes the videos, podcasts, research results, um, farmer stories and other resources. So I'll pop a link to that on our Facebook page after we finish up this evening. And um, also, if you've got any questions for Derek, make sure you pop them in the chat box and we'll pop them to him at the end. <clears throat> right, moving on now to uh, Dr. David Stevens, who is from Egg Research. Um, David's a senior scientist at Egg Research Invermay. Um, and his specialty is farm systems. So he's going to talk to us about some of the work that he and the team at Egg Research are currently undertaking that's of relevance to um, sheep and beef farm systems. Thanks, David. I'll hand over to you. All righty. Thanks for that, Nicola. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's great to see a few people on the um, on the call, a uh, few, few familiar names there. Um, can you put your video on, David, so we can see your wonderful face? Uh, it's it's <laughs> always better. A... Makes it a bit more exciting. <laughs> and now I know. I thought it was quite useful, me not being seen, but that's okay. <laughs> All righty. Um, yeah, so uh, just want to start, depending on how broad the audience is, just to remind everybody that Invermay is a campus of ag research. <clears throat> it's our southernmost campus, and we are still open for business. So for all of those of you who thought that we got shut down, we haven't. Um, we specialize in uh, sheep breeding, genetics, um, in uh, um, environmental performance, uh, farm systems, um, we have uh, a small group in the entomology space, uh, most commonly or most well known, probably uh, Colin Ferguson in that space. Everybody will know him for his grass grub and piranha work. Um, and we also have a uh, sheep reproduction unit here. Um, the, the brief that I've taken on here is basically just to talk about the work that we have running at Invermay rather than the broader ag research work because that takes quite a long time to work through. Um, <clears throat> and I'll just give you a brief run through of some of the projects that we're working on. Um, we'll start with the animals project. So we'll talk a little bit about genetics. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the um, reproductive work that we're doing. Then we'll talk um, a little bit about um, 
some of our wintering work, uh, which has been done um, using some money from MPI under the Sustainable um, Land Management Project. Um, and then as we get towards the end, I'll talk a little bit about uh, virtual fencing, of which you might be interested. Uh, and then if we've got some time, maybe a little bit in the um, legume space. So let's start with our genetics program. And I suppose the most exciting thing that we're doing in the very, or, or have been doing over the last uh, 12 months is helping beef and lamb genetics roll out the cool sheep program. Uh, and that is basically supporting um, our breeders in the uptake of methane measurements and selection um, to produce low methane emission sheep. And this is probably the only uh, mitigation that sheep farmers are going to see, especially our hill country sheep farmers are going to see in the near future. <clears throat> At this stage, we've had over 40 breeders across the country have um, tested animals through our portable accumulation chambers. And you, some people might have heard them referred to as pack chambers. And that equates to about 6,000 animals in the uh, genetics industry that have now been screened. And uh, at the National Field Days, uh, a couple of days ago, we actually had one of our breeders come up and say he's had his first inquiry about um, methane breeding values uh, for, for a client that's um, interested in implementing that on their farm. So, so that trait is heritable. Um, it will make slow progress, but it will make progress. So that's the important part in there. Um, the other exciting part in that is next month, uh, we are trialing prototype chambers to put beef cattle in. And so that's going to generate some base data for that and then get at us the opportunity to generate breeding values for the beef industry as well. Um, and then somewhere along the line, um, the dairy uh, industry want to come to us and uh, record some of their uh, methane emissions and look at the variation in the dairy population. But in the very first instance, we will be uh, next cab off the rank is beef cattle. Um, okay, so. We are also looking at a few other proxies. Um, apart from putting them in a chamber and measuring them for 50 minutes and figuring out how much methane comes off them. And that includes things like the rumen microbiome. So we do a lot of microbiome uh, analysis that tells us what bugs are in the rumen. Um, and, and we know that uh, these are um, related certainly to the animal's upbringing. Um, they will inherit those bugs from their mothers quite quickly in life. Um, and then we're looking at fatty acid profiles that are coming off the um, off those uh, digested products and looking at um, them going into milk and into the fat of, of low methane animals. So just checking uh, some of those correlations. Um, we're just about uh, ready to put some more animals through our um, feed intake facility. Um, Again, looking at the efficiency of the animal, uh, it would appear that the methane production and efficiency are both relatively well correlated. But what we're also trying to do there is look at um, some of the more um, subtropical traits of sheep um, to try and uh, um, combat some of this global warming. And at the other end of the scale, looking at mid-micron animals as well. So, um, Looking for new traits, tail length and sheep is one which is uh, highly heritable, uh, but most heritable in our shorter tailed breeds, such as the Texel or the East Frisian, and not so heritable in things like our Romneys. So um, watch this space. And in also in that space, um, we're looking at the genetics of shedding, which is something that uh, Lydia was also talking about in terms of um, if, and again, creating options for farmers that are a lot broader than our traditional crossbred sheep. Um, and then finally, in the genetic space, uh, again, looking at impacts of climate change on disease risks, such as facial eczema and homonchus around New Zealand. Um, we're basically tracking facial eczema and its spread. Um, we're working on new tests for facial eczema. Uh, that we can work into our breeding programs at the moment. 
And of real interest, which we would love some feedback from, is if anybody has spotted homonchus in the South Island in particular at any stage, because we, we were interested in knowing whether or not any, we've heard of one or two uh, outbreaks, but we're not sure whether they have uh, overwintered or not. Um, and so if anybody's got any um, thoughts about homonchus or has seen a homonchus in the South Island, please um, just give us a call and uh, we'll, we'd love to have a look at that. All righty, so um, on the other part of the animals front, just want to talk a little bit about some of the reproduction work. Uh, and, and a lot of that currently is sitting around um, supplements uh, during pregnancy, early pregnancy, late pregnancy, and um, potentially into lactation to basically improve uh, the immunocompetence is what we'd call it, the robustness of the, the lamb, um, and then uh, increase the efficiency of the animal uh, once those lambs are born. So one project in there is looking at vitamin A supplementation in early lact in sorry in early pregnancy. Um, as I say, it's basically it's a uh, fetal programming approach where the fetus gets to see high vitamin A levels responds by generating a very good immune system, which then means will potentially lead to lower um, lamb losses around birth and uh, improve growth from birth through to weaning. So that's um, a new project, uh, which we are quite excited about. Um, so where, do I, where are we going from here? Let's talk about wintering systems right at the moment. So our wintering systems became part of the sustainable um, land management and climate change program. And we have two programs in there, um, one that I lead and one that Ross Monaghan leads. Um, and Ross is doing the bale wintering um, through Southland, uh, primarily aimed at dairy cows, but certainly can be used, especially with, with um, beef cattle. Um, that's uh, had some really good outcomes to date. And it has uh, several, I suppose, key underlying factors that drive those outcomes. Um, the first one is that you should be running a lower stocking rate than you would with um, kale or um, swede crops. So that reduces uh, total nitrate loading. You're usually working with um, lower nitrogen forages, so baleage and, and saved grass. So again, that reduces the nitrate loadings in those um, situations. And then thirdly, you're working um, in a pasture that will recover after um, you've grazed it off. And so that means that you're soaking nitrogen up and again, uh, not letting it leach. So the preliminary result results out of that program, um, especially in uh, moderate winter conditions, show some quite significant reductions in nitrate leaching under, under those systems compared to our traditional kale systems. So that's, that's gotta be a real bonus. Um, those, uh, yep. And then the other one that we're doing is um, looking at wintering with less crops in general. And so in that space, we're looking at um, how feed flows, how we, how we can move feed around on the shoulders of the season, in the, in the autumn and in the spring, uh, we're looking at the impacts of um, diverse uh, mixtures. And again, looking at how we move feed around a little bit. So can we utilize more of those mixtures in the autumn um, to push more grass into winter? So we've got a, a, a better uh, grass wintering system um, or, and, and letting them recover for the early spring and again, utilizing them then. And a lot of those advantages are quite similar to the bale grazing, um, where we're using reasonably moderate uh, nitrogen levels in the forage, um, and then depositing that nitrogen in a way that it gets taken up again by another, uh, by the regrowth of that crop rather than it, uh, being exposed to leaching. And again, when we're shifting feed around like that, we're also reducing stocking rate or instantaneous stocking rate at least, so that we are again lowering nitrate loadings in those instances. So 
that's where we're up to with some of that wintering work. Um, so I'm going to talk about virtual fencing. And I'm sure some of you have heard about virtual fencing and there are a couple of products. Uh, the Halter product is on the market for um, dairy cows at the moment. And the East Shepherd product, which was Adjacent's but is now Gallagher's, uh, will be coming out in the spring. And they are currently uh, in beta testing of that product and um, are very, very um, excited about the results that they've had with, with their latest, um, with their latest uh, hardware and software. So um, the containment of the animals is uh, complete with the latest round um, and the, um, the uh, animal welfare implications are, are really good. So um, it, once uh, training has been undertaken, if anybody knows the technology, they get trained for a week or so where they get used to the fact that they have a, um, an audio signal in their ear that tells them when they're approaching a fence and they get a very um, small pulse of electricity if they cross the fence. Uh, once those animals are trained, they're basically not they're, they're responding to the audio signal only. So that tells us that the training method and the ongoing animal welfare concerns are very low in that instance. So, so they're really excited about that. Um, and we've been working with them, uh, looking at um, what parts of the environment we need to keep animals out of, where sediment risk or loss risk is really high. Um, looking at can we uh, do redirect the animals in the environment so that they spread nutrients appropriately and don't take it all under the trees for you. Uh, some of those um, sort of opportunities, uh, like I say, with the technology working so well, uh, we think there's every opportunity to transform the way that we graze our hill country uh, and improve the utilization of the feed that's there improve the distribution of nutrients and reduce the environmental impact. So that's quite an exciting project, which is um, ongoing. Um, we have also had a legumes and hill country program and hard hill country looking at low fertility. Um, John Chapman, who uh, Derek was talking about, was, was one of our farmers in that program and we had a few others uh, further south. Um, just to highlight again, one of the things that Derek was talking about, a lot of this uh, information, especially the practical stuff for farmers, is um, published in the Journal of New Zealand Grasslands. It's open access. Anyone can get a hold of a copy of it. Anyone can look at all of the papers that are there. Um, you search Derek name, you search my name, you search Lydia's name, you'll find um, a wealth of, of knowledge that's being published there and a wealth of farmer experience that gets published at the same time. So it's a great repository of that sort of practical um, knowledge being demonstrated on the ground. So um, I will leave it there, Nicola. I think I've probably covered enough ground at this stage. That's great. Thanks heaps for that, David. Um, there's a really wide range of really interesting work being done there, so I imagine it's hard to um, pick out um, <clears throat> everything that you want to talk about. If farmers want to find out more, so we've talked about grasslands, is there <coughs> work published on the Ag Research website or any other websites that might be in a slightly more digestible form, shall we say? So, um, yes. So if you're, if you're interested in the Cool Sheep program, for example, um, have a look on the beetle lamb genetics page yep. on the website. So, so that, that's got some details around that. Um, there's, I was talking about the wintering stuff. Uh, Quorum Sense has published some of our, our work in that space and beetle lamb New Zealand has also um, got some of that data from the first field days that were held last year. Um, so, so that stuff sits there, so it's quorum sense. Um, there was, a, there is an associated program with the uh, wintering stuff for catch cropping. Uh, and then again, there's a Facebook page for that, catch cropping for something. If only oh, I could read my own writing, cleaner fresh water. 
is the Facebook page. So you can have a look at that. Um, what else? Oh, and then if you want anything about the um, virtual fencing, then the Gallagher's eShepherd uh, page on the website will get you started in that direction. Oh, I'm just making some notes of that now and I will put um, links to that information along with the website um, that Derek referenced on our Facebook page after tonight's session so you can look into it and find out more. Um, yeah, once again, if you've got any other questions for David, please type them in the chat box. I'll just get our other speakers to um, turn their mics and videos on and we'll just do a quick Q&A session. I've got a few questions banked up here already. <clears throat> um, so just on the e-shepherd one, David, um, a question from Dawn. Do you think we can use e-shepherd for grazing wetlands and reducing the need for waterway fencing flood-prone areas? Are you doing any work in this space? So, hi Dawn, yes. Um, and to expand on that, <laughs> yes, this is one of the areas that we're really interested in. Uh, where we can give much finer control of the animal, so that you might have you might have an area which occasionally gets gets wet in the winter, but is okay for grazing in the summer. Uh, so so the opportunity then is to to shift to basically provide a, an exclusion zone in the winter where the animals can't get there, so there's no soil damage. Um, the proviso that I would have is is have a look in your wetlands and make sure there's nothing. Uh, special in the way of um, botanical composition in there. So, so if it's just a bit of pasture that gets uh, flooded a couple of times a year, then that's fine. In the summer, you'll be able to utilize it. If it's actually an important habitat, which some of the Central Otago habitats are, <laughs> please have a look before you just uh, randomly graze it with your cattle. Well, good. Thanks, David. Um, and while you're on there, um, a question from Alyssa. Is there any work being undertaken to identify a gene marker for methane production um, so that we could uh, perhaps screen for it in the future? So, so one of the, uh, I suppose, what we're looking for is proxies for methane emission. And so one of those is actually looking at the rumen microbiome. So we've, we've gone down the track of gene markers in the past. Uh, and what we've done now is we're, we're using um, um, whole sequence sequencing, gene, gene, genome by, by sequencing. So um, creating the whole genome and looking at correlations because the earlier work with genes that control it, um, usually we find these are multi-genetic traits. And so it's not as like you're just gonna find a gene that makes your eyes blue. Um, because because the rumen microbiome is such a complex thing, um, it's it's actually much easier for us to make progress by by examining what the microbiome looks like and then correlating it to methane production and correlating it to genetic um, progress in the animals. So the microbiome testing um, will probably become a replacement for the pack chambers as we develop our understanding of that. And that's a very cheap or will be a relatively cheap test by comparison to um, the slow progress you make with pack chambers when you have to hold animals in there 12 at a time and uh, 50 minutes a time. It does. It is quite slow in terms of screening populations. How would you take those samples? <clears throat> um, Quite similarly to how you um, feed a lamb at the moment with a tube down its throat. Just the reverse of that. Okay, cool. Um, I've got a couple of questions for Lydia. Um, one from Tim um, regarding the, um, the drinking water for sheep. Uh, would you think in Central Otago some of there'd be increased demand for, from sheep for additional water? I mean, are you looking at different environments around New Zealand? Um, not at this stage, but th the answer is yes, we would expect that they'd have increased demand for, uh, for a couple of reasons. One would be their actual, you know, physiological um, state in terms of keeping themselves cool. Um, and that's why we're sort of in the next stage looking at shade um, as a factor um, for animal welfare and that sort of thing. 
going alongside it, but also you'd assume that in Otago, you know, the 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 pasture composition um, and availability would be, you know, a lot less moisture content um, for them at that time of the year as well. So you sort of get the double effect of of the, you know, they'll be consuming less water from the pasture and and it'll be hotter, um, and so it'll have more of an effect on them. So yeah, we would expect, um, yeah, more challenging. Cool. Um, and another one, Re, the nitrate leaching trial. Um, will the nitrate leaching trial be used to update overseer? Um, have any legume dominant pathways been trialed? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, so the this work is yeah. The the main aim is that we want to use this data to improve the accuracy um, of overseer. Um, and and to learn more because there's there's actually very little um, actual data from on, on nitrate leaching, particularly um, under sheep grazing in New Zealand. Um, and for the the legume content, we we haven't uh, sort of tried it directly in the the sheep study, but we've had a result in a parallel uh, study site, uh, which was grazed by dairy cattle where. Um, they were looking at a different proportion of plantain in the diet. And in those treatments, what they found was that um, white clover became a, a, an invasive weed in some of those treatments. And in those treatments where white clover was up to sort of more than 50% of the botanical composition, uh, the leaching actually uh, increased um, quite a lot. So it is a challenge for... Uh, going back to Derek's comment about, you know, we want um, high uh, nitrogen pastures because that, that grows feed for us, but, but certainly those um, high legume content swords are likely to be leaching more, but certainly an area for more research to be done. I'll oh. take issue with that, Lydia. <laughs> We're talking about Central Otago. The chances of leaching in Central Otago... <laughs> Under rain fed are pretty darn small. You've got to remember that um, you work on the west coast. And if we, you know, that these things don't leach. And, we can um, have some irrigation, Derek. Yeah. Yeah, and under irrigation you can if you do if you don't do it well. But in general, um, the nitrate leaching issues from legumes. White clover has a terrible root system. The other legumes pick up nitrate. And so they actually switch off their nitrogen fixation process in the presence of high nitrate, uh, high nitrate in the soil. I mean, nitrate is what actually is produced out of nitrogen fixation. So that's it's the same chemical, and so it gets taken up. So in dryland systems, it's you know that's not an issue. We're we're in the opposite situation in in dry areas. This is central Otago. Not Manawa too, where it rains. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You're still it, wearing... it, it might be the case in uh, uh, Otago, but it's not all all around New Zealand, unfortunately. No, but you wear you have to wear your jacket all through the year because it rained the whole <laughs> bloody year up there this year. <laughs> no, we've had we've had two weeks without rain. <laughs> okay, a drought. Cool. Hey, thanks, you guys. Um, that was a really great session. There's some awesome content in there. And like I say, I'll put um, links to further information on our Facebook page so people can do a bit more reading about some of the work that you are um, doing at the moment. Um, so, yeah, big thank you to Derek, David and Lydia for joining us um, this evening. It's been really great. Um, and thank you to everyone who has attended. Um, like I say, we'll put the links on the Facebook page. Next week, we've got another session on Monday um, looking at financial management for challenging times and featuring um, rural accountant George Collier, who's got some tips for you, um, and also Nick Beebe from Beef and Lamb, um, who's going to provide insights and opportunities into the red meat sector going forward. Just a reminder that you all need to register for that session separately, so um, jump back onto the Beef and Lamb events page as you did for this one and make sure you get your registration in so you don't miss out. Um, other than that, that's all from me. Thanks everyone for attending and um, hope you've enjoyed tonight's session. All right. Thanks, thanks, team.